Can everybody hear me? Hear me now. Um, so stress, bullying and, and harassment claims and uh, how can we identify and prevent these claims? We wanted to talk to you about these because we predicted that there was likely to be an increase in the number of this type of claim post quarks uh, coming into, into play. Um, and I think we, our own statistics, our own data that we've had a look at um, over the last two to three years is bearing that out. We, see, we saw a sharp increase in the number of this type of claims between 2013 and 2014, um, a further increase in 2015, and the number for this year is, is going to be broadly similar to, to last year. Um, it's an issue that the CII's uh, new generation uh, project had a look at about 18 months ago um, and ACAS have also published a policy discussion paper in relation to bullying in the workplace uh, within the last 12 months as well. So it is an issue which, uh, which is coming onto the radar, uh, not just for, for claimants but also the insurance industry in looking at how to combat these claims. Now, this is the most important slide of the talk because this is the CII uh, CPD tick the box bit. So we've got some learning objectives. Um, the, uh, we're going to have a look at uh, deciding when in any given circumstances uh, policy, liability policies are likely to respond in these types of claims and Vanessa's going to have a look at that in a minute. Um, we're going to try and understand um, how the technical complexities, and they are legion, the, this is a very technically complex area, uh, can be used to build defence strategies and where they create risks on both sides of the fence. Um, we're going to appreciate how to protect a defendant's position and contain costs through uh, early and effective investigation. Uh, and we're going to spot the risks and emerging issues. What we're not going to do is conduct a masterclass in the law on stress, because that would take us all day. But for those of you who are here for the CPD, the coffee's outside. Um, and I'm going to hand over to Vanessa, first of all, uh, to have a look at the, uh, the policy coverage side of things. Hi, everyone. Um, right, I'm just going to touch briefly on um, policy cover issues. And I'm sure for most of you, the first thing, one of the first things you do when you get a new claim land on your desk is to think about what the policy issues are. And you're very sure very familiar with a lot of what the basic policy issues are on um, personal injury claims um, but there's quite a few that come up quite regularly on stress claims that are really important to understand at the beginning um, and place reservation of rights if you need to on the claims. Um, the first one I'm going to look at is bodily injury. Um, in a negligence claim, claimant has to prove injury to get home so the policy will cover that claim because they have to prove personal injury. In a claim in the Employment Tribunal for Discrimination or in a claim um, under the Protection from Harassment Act, you don't have to prove injury to get home. You only have to prove injury to feelings or anxiety and distress. So do your EL policies cover that? Well, potentially, because although you don't have to prove um, bodily injury um, to get oh, sorry, uh, psychiatric injury to get home on a claim, you might do. So a claimant might start out with a claim that actually they allege personal injury, they may or may not by the end of the claim have established personal injury, but they still have got home on that claim. So in those cases, you're going to want to put a reservation of rights on that claim and think about, do we take over conduct or don't we? How substantial is the personal injury element of that claim? If it's, a, if it's an employment tribunal claim, um, is that the main part of the claim or actually are there more important other non-psychiatric injury elements to that, to that employment tribunal claim? Um, standard wording for bodily injury is generally death, disease, illness, nervous shock is often in there and that will be um, limited to clinically significant psychiatric injuries. So the claimant's going to have to prove a, a clinically significant psychiatric injury for your policy to respond. But we are seeing increasing numbers of, of extra bits of wording being chucked in there. Um, I think a lot of it migrates from a US, seems to migrate from US um, employers liability policies and you're getting wording like mental anguish, mental upset, those sort of wordings. Um, and that's definitely going to be straying into injury to feeling, anxiety and distress territory. So if you've got those kind of wordings in your policies, you have the potential to be covering injury to feelings awards and um, anxiety and distress awards that you'll get in um, the Employment Tribunal and in um, Protection from Harassment Act claims. So you need to look at your wording, policy wording very carefully and think about what reservation of rights you're going to put on, on claims and how involved you're going to be. And we'll come on to it in a moment, but um, decisions, you'll need to take decisions fairly early on as to 
do we jump in and take over conduct of this claim or do we step back and just allow the insured to deal with it or allow the insurance um, employment solicitors to deal with it um, and there's various you know tactical advantages to doing one or the other um, in terms of uh, deliberate acts um, as you all know, you can't insure against a deliberate act because you don't like the colour of your carpet that your wife's bought you. You can't chuck a pot of paint over it and expect to get a new carpet. Deliberate acts, you're not going to be compensated for. Um, if you're insured as an organisation, which often in stress at work claims, you're insured is going to be a company, deliberate acts by the employees of that company will be deemed accidental. So if your employees are committing harassment of each other, that's going to be covered by the policy. Um, if it's a deliberate act committed by an, the controlling mind of the company, so somebody who's significantly senior who can take major decisions on behalf of that company, then their acts will be intentional acts on behalf of the policyholder and cover won't apply. So if you've got a CEO of a company who's sexually harassing his um, PA, then it's likely that that isn't going to be covered under the policy and you need to put, again, put a reservation of rights on that, decline policy potentially if you need to. Um, late notification is another important area um, in stress at work claims because often you will get a um, case landing on your desk where there's already been an employment tribunal claim, claimant raised a grievance, claimant's been off sick for a really long time, has now issued um, a personal injury claim and this is when you get notified about it. That's probably too late because your insured probably knew at some stage before then that there was a claim there, that there was a personal injury element to that claim. They've probably been told the person's suffering from stress at work, um, potential arguments being raised about this has been caused by you or one of your uh, members of staff. And so you need to consider late notification. Um, as you know, you can't decline policy cover for late notification. But what you can do is reserve the rights to recover any damages that you have to pay out on that claim. Um, so it's important to, important to look at your policy to see when, what the criteria is for notifying you. you know, does it say when a claim is notified? Does it say when circumstances giving rise to a claim? Um, so look at what your policy says about that um, and consider what the insured knew and when they knew it. Um, Another thing you might want to also consider is when you want to get involved in these type of claims. Um, as Chris will come on to in a moment, there's certain tactical advantages to getting on board in these claims at a much earlier stage. And so it's worth considering, do you want to encourage your insureds actually to notify you of these claims when they get a sick certificate that says stress at work or when they get a grievance being raised that says, I'm off sick and it's because you've done this to me, um, when an employment tribunal claim comes in? Do you want them to start notifying you of these claims at an earlier stage so you can at least have some influence over what's going on? Because if you do, actually, you, can, uh, you have the opportunity to, to create circumstances where you can defend claims or avoid claims completely or at least mitigate the value of those claims. So it's worth kind of considering when you want to become involved in them. Um, uh, the last point I just want to touch on was um, employment tribunal claims. If an employment tribunal claim comes in, as I mentioned, you probably want to have a res reservation of rights there because um, the chances are there's going to be an issue over whether there's policy cover or not. Um, but it's also important to find out from your um, insureds if they have any other policies. I'm constantly staggered by the number of companies who don't actually know that they have legal expenses cover. A number of insureds where mm. I get a claim in and I say, well, have you got legal expenses? They go, oh, yeah, we just found out we have. Yeah, we didn't know about that. Mm. And yeah. then you go, well, it's a bit late now because you probably won't be able to notify because, you know, if you notify them now, it's probably too late. But they just they just don't know that they've got it or they, know, they don't realise that it covers employment tribunal claims. Um, and also EPL policies that are add-on to DNO policies and there's lots of, of, of policies that people just don't realise that they have. So it's worth finding out at a various stage, are there any other insurers lurking around who can help pay for the defence costs and, and contribute towards that? Um, and if you do, just on a final point, if you do reserve rights, it's important not only to tell the insured and to tell the brokers and to tell um, anyone who's connected with that but also to tell the claimant because um, if you have a claim where it's an EL situation the chances are they will expect that an EL policy will respond and if there's any risk that the EL policy won't be responding then the claimant should be aware of that at an early stage because there's potential cost issues there so it's important not only to tell the, the uh, insured and the broker but also to tell the, um, to tell the claimant. And I think that's it for policy issues. Right. Um, to look again um, at the uh, statistics in a little bit more detail, Michelle touched on some of the stats at the, at the start of this. Uh, but it's worth drilling into them a little bit in terms of trying to identify where uh, claims are coming from. Um, 
I think this works, yes. Um, to start with, these, these statistics come from the HSE research that, uh, as Michelle said, is published annually. So this is last year's statistics. They're the most up-to-date we have. And the HSE compile this from the Labour Force Survey, which is a household survey. They, they, do, they, run, they run this quarterly, and that's self-reporting. So people will self-report uh, when they have been absent. This is absence from work due to ill health, specifically due to mental health and stress-related issues. Um, and the statistics also come from GPs. Uh, from the uh, Health and Occupation Research Network, which uh, some GP practices participate in. Um, so these um, statistics here show that um, where, where claims are coming from in terms of prevalence, uh, you can see public admin and defence is the, is the biggest area here, but the private sector next door, communication, business and finance uh, is also fairly healthy in terms of numbers of, uh, of absences from, from work. Um, and it, it's sitting about the uh, the industry prevalence uh, industry prevalence overall. Um, in terms of breaking into the, the the public sector figures a little bit um, are down here. Um, you you might expect human health and social work. We see a lot of claims in education, a lot of teachers, a lot of employees in schools, um, and uh, flicking on a little bit to to this. The, the sectors the sectors tell us only so much, uh, but these are this is breaking it down a little bit more by occupation. Um, and uh, if you look here, and this is important, if you're thinking about IBNR and where your potential pool of claims might be coming from, look at this. Um, this is professional occupations, and this again is prevalence, but it's the most prevalent um, uh, of all in terms of uh, in terms of the type of occupations. Now that's relevant because insofar as people are off sick with um, psychiatric illnesses allegedly caused by stress, um, and you're looking at loss of earnings, the, the biggest loss of earnings potential is going to be in this kind of area. And that's, we're looking at the, high, the highest prevalence here. Next door to it, managers and senior officials, and next door again, associate and technical professionals. If you take those as a lump, um, and you're looking at IBNR, um, that, that's, these are, could be potentially quite expensive claims. Interestingly, uh, lower, slightly lower, uh, we've got sales and customer service. I find that interesting because if, there, if there's a target-driven environment, the epitome of a target-driven environment, it's got to be uh, certainly historically sales and customer service. Maybe these industries have got their act together recently. I don't know what the explanation for that is. Um, and, uh, and if we break down a little bit further uh, before into the uh, further rather into the professionals down here, uh, we see teaching professionals that bears out certainly my experience. Um, business and media, public service professionals here, health producing a uh, producing a lot of absence. Um, this slide represents um, our experience of where we see issues in stress claims arising. What's driving? claims, what, what are the kind of factors in the workplace particularly which are driving claims. Now this correlates quite closely, perhaps it's unsurprising that it does, but it correlates quite closely with the HSE management standards, uh, which was guidance issued uh, back 2004-2005 to employers as to how to manage stress in the workplace, how to run risk assessments in relation to stress, and where issues might arise. Um, the top one, um, th this is really to do with workloads, um, work overload type cases. The, the amount of control people have got over their, their work and how they do it. Uh, relationships, that's where your bullying and harassment cases are potentially going to come from. Um, but how does, that, how does that translate into what the HSE research has found? Well, um, this clearly, the, the, this, the top table here, top graphs here, are from the self-reports. That's the Labour Force survey data, the self-reports. So what people are saying when they're, when they're asked, have you been off work due to a stress-related problem? Um, they're saying, well, workload is one of my biggest concerns. The other factors identified by the HSE, um, not really featuring particularly heavily. But look at this. This data here is from the GP Thor program, the, uh, the G data that's coming in from the GPs. This is the data uh, coming from the situation where people have been off work and they fell ill enough to seek medical advice. So it seems to me that this, is the, this tells us more about where claims are going to come from uh, than this. Uh, and this is of particular interest. 
uh, the interpersonal uh, relationships. That's again where bullying uh, and harassment claims are going to come from. And that's, that is a percentage, it's not a prevalence. So you're talking about of the, uh, of the illness and absence from work reported through GPs, 23% of it or thereabout is due to what could be bullying and harassment. And it seems if you were to do um, an analysis of how likely an absence is to produce a claim, that's more likely to produce a claim than this. You'll get some claims from, from this, but this is the, mainly the workload type cases. But they're harder to prove for claimants because they've got to prove foreseeability of injury. Uh, and it's harder to prove foreseeability of injury in the traditional um, um, overwork type case than it perhaps is in a bullying case. So that's a bit of a backdrop on the, on the statistics uh, and where claims might, where you might start to see claims coming from. Uh, I did say I'm not going to have a treatise on the law on this, but we need to understand a little bit about what the legal basis for stress claims perhaps is. Um, common law, negligence, you'll be familiar with, that's fairly straightforward. Foreseeability of psychiatric harm is the key gatekeeper. Uh, that's the in the assessment of breach of duty, what a claimant must establish. Um, claimants also will frequently, particularly in the employment um, side of things, will try to run claims uh, either instead or in the alternative in contract. They'll say, you breached my employment contract in the way that you've conducted yourself. Does that make a difference? In many cases, probably not. Um, foreseeability comes in at the assessment of what losses are foreseeable as a result of the breach, rather than in looking, is there a breach in the first place? But ultimately, foreseeability has got to be there. Um, claimants have tried to use contract uh, in a novel way to get around some of the restrictions um, that they face in, in bringing claims towards the end of employment. And I'll have a look at uh, a, 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 a significant case uh, in due course. Statute um, is the last area to look at. Um, Vanessa has mentioned employment tribunals and claimants can have statutory causes of action for distress and compensation for injury to feelings under various acts. The obvious one is the Equality Act discrimination um, of, uh, in relation to various protected characteristics arising in the workplace. Not necessarily arising in the workplace though, PL discrimination can arise as well. Uh, protection from Harassment Act is a major uh, consideration. If claimants can establish the necessary degree of conduct to establish harassment, then they don't need to prove foreseeability, which is a major advantage for claimants. So claimants in a bullying case will try and also bring a statutory case under the PHA as well. And there are other examples. Data Protection Act is one that, uh, that is often missed, uh, but could be a source of claims also. Um, so, um, this is a bit of a takeaway. Um, this, this slides will be available to everybody online after this, um, but you can keep, uh, you can refer to this. Um, but this starts to show you where some of the complexities for claimants might arise. Let's look at limitation. Um, if you've got a, a, an employment related uh, discrimination claim where there is a personal injury claimed, which would trigger a liability policy, um, you've got three months, the claimant has got three months to bring that and they must, they must bring it in the employment tribunal, cannot bring it in the county court. If you see that in the county court, strike it out. Um, Equality Act, public liability, it's six months. So different again to what you'd normally expect. This time got to be brought in the county court. Uh, the usual common law and uh, contract cases, it's three years because it's personal injury is the time limit and it can be brought in the county or high court. But look at the protection from harassment tax, six years six-year limitation period. So don't get caught out by that. It's another reason why claimants like it. Um, if they've messed up uh, in relation to the common law or other causes of action, uh, they may have six years to bring a harassment claim if they can establish that. Um, so uh, worth bearing all these in mind. Don't get caught out, but watch for claimants who are caught out by these. Um, what about strategies for um, defence strategies for trying to close uh, these claims down? Well, there's there's four. There's three technical ones and there's a general one. So let's deal with the technical strategies potentially first of all. Um, settlement agreement. Um, Vanessa quite rightly mentioned uh, that you need to think about when you want to be notified about these things or when you want to notify your insurers 
uh, about uh, the type of situations which might lead to a stress claim. If you have somebody who goes off work uh, saying that they're stressed, if they bring a grievance in relation to matters which have caused a stress-related illness uh, or may give rise to an absence, if there's a performance management process going on, if there's a disciplinary going on, uh, which leads to uh, the type of situations which might give rise to a stress-related illness. Knowing about this at the earliest possible stage gives you the opportunity to start to deploy uh, preventive strategies in relation to claims. And this is the value of a very astute insurance broker uh, or an astute claims manager at a policyholder who can bring these issues to the attention of an insurer at an early stage and give them the chance to get involved. Um, if there is a termination uh, of employment, a termination payment made when someone's employment is, is terminated, or if there's an employment tribunal uh, which is settled, uh, there is uh, a settlement agreement or, a, or, or a, an agreement entered into in relation to any termination payment or settlement payment that's being made. That will set out the various different claims which are being compromised. Uh, it's very important that you cover, from an employment perspective, all the potential employment legislation under which an employee might make a claim. But from the point of view of a liability policy, there's the opportunity here to include one the Protection from Harassment Act, and secondly, personal injury claims, of which the claimant ought to know uh, at the point of entering into the agreement. If you can get that into the wording, any future claim is gone, and you'll be able to, to meet it with a defensive accord and satisfaction. Say, so, look, you, you, you've settled, you've compromised this, you've settled it. Um, now, claimants will, of course, often not agree to that if they're properly advised. But there's also the risk that if you try to argue for that, you might put ideas into heads and set hairs running in relation to potential future uh, personal injury claims which weren't contemplated at that stage. But if it's clear that there's going to be a potential claim, or there might be, um, it's worth getting involved at that stage, riding shotgun with the, the policyholders, um, employment lawyers, and seeing if you can protect your position for future claims. Uh, in this way. Sometimes, if you've had the chance to do an early investigation, you've worked with the policyholder and it's clear you're going to be at risk, you might be able to make an ex-gratia to top up an employment-related settlement to get your all claims discharged, and you might buy off a six-figure reserve with a payment of a few grand. It's not for every case, uh, but it's worth considering if you feel you're at risk. Um, the next point is abuse of process. Um, this goes back to the Employment Tribunal once again, um, and it goes back to an ancient rule, that's why Methuselah is on the slide, and it comes out of a case called Henderson and Henderson from 1843. If you have a cause of action, you've got to bring all your claims relating to that cause of action in one action. You can't bring lots of actions one after the other for different aspects of your loss. So if you're in the Employment Tribunal, and as I said, if you've got a discrimination case and you've got an injury claim related to your discrimination, the Equality Act says you must, must bring that in the, uh, in the employment tribunal within three months. So if you've run your discrimination case, you've got um, a remedy in the employment tribunal for that. Then we'll issue some separate proceedings in a few years' time for, um, for a psychiatric injury in the county court. That's an abusive process, and there's an authority to that effect. Sheriff uh, Sharif, it is, in fact, and Klein Tugs. Um, so that's worth bearing in mind. If you've got a claim and there has been um, an employment tribunal run already involving something which would have given rise to a right to personal injury, such as discrimination, then you must be, uh, you must be alive to that and you could run this potential argument to get rid of it at the outset. Manner of dismissal is, another, uh, is the third uh, technical um, potential strategy. Um, this involves making a distinction between whether the acts which have caused the psychiatric illness come out of the employment or whether they come out of the process of a dismissal. So if they come right at the end, now obviously this involves termination of employment cases. This is not where someone's still employed. This is where employment's come to an end. Um, but if, in order to give rise to a civil claim for damages capable of triggering your policy, um, the acts which give rise to the loss have got to have arisen prior to the dismissal. If you can argue that the acts which have given rise to the loss come out of the actual dismissal itself, to the process of dismissal, then you can stop the claim in its tracks. And the reason for that is because Parliament has said anything to do with dismissal comes under the employment rights legislation. 
and no, it doesn't get dealt with in any other way. So it gets dealt with under employment rights legislation. It's subject to the only remedies that that legislation gives, um, and it has to be dealt with in the employment tribunal. Now, the key thing, the case of Dunahy on the slide, you don't get damages for personal injury in employment rights claims. So if you, if you have a constructive dismissal or a dismissal, unfair dismissal case, you're not going to get personal injury damages, and that's tough. Uh, you might have been dismissed in an appalling way, um, you might have had a psychiatric injury as a result, but Parliament has said, too bad, y you get a financial remedy uh, in relation to your financial losses, uh, capped, uh, but you can't have personal injury arising out of that. So it's critical if you've got a case where someone ha someone's employment has ended um, uh, uh, in the context of a stress claim to work out, has this come out of the manner of dismissal? Or has it come from what happened before the dismissal? Uh, and the key authority for that is Johnson and Unisys. And that's why we call that process of dismissal bit of the claim the Johnson exclusion zone, because it excludes uh, the possibility of bringing a personal injury damages claim. So this is really important. Now, in Edwards and Chesterfield, the claimant said, well, we're, we're not having any of this Johnson stuff because um, the reason that, uh, that we've been dismissed uh, and the reason that, uh, that we're in the mess that we are is because you, Mr. Employer, failed to follow your own processes and you wrote those processes into my employment contract. You incorporated them by reference. So I, I'm, not running, um, I'm not running a dismissal case. I'm running a breach of contract case. So I, I don't, I'm not affected by Johnson. And the, the House of Lords said... No. Um, if it is to do with dismissal, whether you're running a contract case or any other uh, way of trying to get around this, you're brought within Johnson, you're brought within the employment rights legislation, and you're restricted to the only remedies they give you. So Johnson exclusion zone, really important to look at it. Um, it gives rise to lots of arguments, though, because where does the zone begin? What about in a lengthy disciplinary process, which may start with an investigation, um, and then there's a report, and then there's uh, a recommendation to proceed with a, a disciplinary, and then there's a letter to the claimant saying, we're going to take you to a disciplinary, um, and then there's a couple of adjourned hearings, and then there's a final hearing. Where does the zone begin? Well, there isn't any clear guidance from the courts on this, but what we can say is that the, the further before the actual point of dismissal you get, the less likely you are to be able to bring yourself within the zone. Um, but it's a very, very important uh, issue to be aware of uh, at the earliest stage. Um, so that's just summarising. If, if it's an antecedent breach, if it's a breach of duty which arises during the employment uh, and before you get to the point of dismissal, uh, then you're in civil claim territory. Uh, if it's manner of dismissal, if it's actually to do with the dismissal process itself, uh, then you shouldn't be paying any claims. Um, and the final, uh, the final tactical issue uh, here is uh, just to stress the merits and the importance of getting involved in this type of case at the earliest possible stage. Maybe before there's a letter of claim, if you know there's a circumstance which might give rise to a claim, my strong recommendation would be to invest some time and effort in investigating it, preserve the evidence, possibly get involved with the insureds, uh, with the policyholders, employment lawyers, and helping to steer the claim into one of the three areas that I've just described before there is a claim to set up a potential uh, defence strategy. Um, and the other key issue is know your risk and know it early. Because if you can't, if you don't have any of these technical defences in a Quox environment uh, where a claimant is going to bet on you wanting not to run up a huge amount of money you can't recover, but equally is going to be pursuing this case on a CFA, you want to be showing the claimant at a, within the pre-action protocol period how much time and resources you've thrown at this, how good your investigation has been, and give them a really robust denial so that they can see the mountain that they've got to climb on a CFA if they want to issue proceedings. Or, if you really are at risk, get it settled before you get into litigation because the costs in a litigated stress claim, particularly that goes to trial, uh, can obviously be very high. And I've said at the end, don't dismiss the portal. Uh, we've actually just admitted one bank to rights case in the portal. The claimant has in, sent it through in the portal, no doubt chuckling under their collar and thinking, we'll see what the defendants make of this. Well, we've got a great, the policyholder did a brilliant job uh, on originally in investigating, and we know that we're bank to rights, and we've admitted it in the, in the portal. And we've got portal costs out of that. Now, that's potentially a six-figure um, saving on reserve. So it just, I... I, I caution, don't dismiss the portal altogether. I'll hand back to Vanessa. Right, so um, I'm going to look at sort of a few red flags. 
Um, essentially, it's ways of managing claims, a um, few things to consider when you're handling stress claims, and some recent changes to case law that it's worth bearing in mind um, just when you look at how to, um, to progress with these matters. Um, as Chris mentioned, um, if you can get involved in an early stage, there are lots of tactical reasons for doing it. You know, it's, it's, you can ward off claims, you can prevent claims from going ahead, you can settle potentially within um, uh, uh, the uh, terms of a settlement agreement. Um, and another important aspect of that is managing the employee. Because as part of a claim, particularly if it's pursued in negligence, you have the foreseeability test. And so often an employer will only be put on notice that somebody is at risk of suffering a psychiatric injury when they're told, well, they've been on long-term sick or um, they have raised a grievance which says, you know, their health is being affected by the fact they're working too long hours or their boss is bullying them. So there'll be some trigger there that will put the employer on notice that this person is potentially going to go down the route of a claim, but, but stepping back from that, potentially just going to be going off sick. Um, and so it's important to manage that employee and it's important for your insureds to understand how to manage those employees. Um, as I say, a grievance is often a, the, the first step in a process that an employer is aware that there's, a, there's an issue with this particular employee. And a well-handled grievance process can present you with the best defence possible in a claim because it will show that the employer took notice of what the employee was saying, they approached it properly, they analysed the situation, they investigated it and this was the conclusion they reached. Um, it's always difficult when they make an unhelpful concession in a, in a grievance. You know, you get, get grievance uh, outcome letters where you read it and they go, yes, Mr. we found Mr. Jones was harassing Miss Smith and um, she told her line manager and he did nothing about it, so we're really sorry about that. Uh, so, you know, you don't want them to go down that route because that's complete, complete stuff as any defence you might possibly have. Um, Return to work is another important part of the process, that if somebody's gone off sick, then you're on notice that person is um, vulnerable to psychiatric injury. And so when they come back to work, if they do come back to work, um, it's really important that you then take steps to make sure that employee is protected. And so the return to work process is really important. Um, you know, you need to make sure that the person sees occupational health, that they um, there's a return to work meeting, that the reasons for the absence are discussed. Why were you off sick? What can we do to support you on your return? And if those steps are put in place again that builds up a brilliant defense to a claim if, if a claim is ever pursued um, so it's, it's really important for your insurers to understand this and if they don't understand it there's a question of well do you start as insurers intervening at an earlier stage or you know, do you put structures in place so that insurers understand that these are the steps they need to take to protect their their uh, positions um, I have to say, insureds, I think, are getting better at this. People are understanding psychiatric injury a lot more. You know, I go back 15 years to when I started dealing with these claims, and they were, you, you know, somebody would go off sick, and somebody would come back, and, well, we came back, so we didn't, you seemed all right, it was all right, so we just didn't do anything. They, you know, people just didn't, people didn't like talking about it, people didn't like talking about stress, they didn't like talking about psychiatric injury, they didn't know what to do with them, so they just sort of left them. Whereas now, um, insurers are generally pretty good. They will um, try and make at least some effort towards um, looking after people. One of the things that does come up a lot is where um, they'll get an occupational health report and it's a, it's a fantastic occupational health report that says you need to do this, this and this, this is a strategy to put in place and then they don't follow it through. The insurers need to understand that they need to, you know, if they, if they receive advice and they need to try and follow it, otherwise that gets them into worse trouble. Um, I think Chris touched on earlier about the um, capability terminations, that if somebody is going out under a settlement agreement, then you can get in there and prevent a claim being pursued. Um, suspensions and disciplinaries. Um, it's amazing how often people go off sick as soon as they're being disciplined. It's extraordinary. Mm -hmm. um, it's the most, you know, every single time a stress claim comes in that there's been any kind of disciplinary, it's generally somebody was performing badly or doing something wrong. They were told they're going to be facing a disciplinary and they go off sick with stress. Claimants seem to think that it provides them with some sort of immunity to mm. being disciplined because, well, now I'm stressed, you can't do anything to, to progress the disciplinary because I'm stressed, so you have to just let it go, um, which is, of course, complete nonsense. But, in, but insurers have to be careful about how they then manage that disciplinary. They have to approach it in the right way. They have to make adjustments to make sure that when the person is going through the disciplinary process that they're, they're treated properly. Um, uh, a great case. Is, is Matthew still around, Matthew Harrington? <laughs> Is he gone? Mm. Matthew Harrington was here earlier and he had a case of Mian and um, Coventry University, which is a great example of this. Um, claimant was a senior lecturer and she was accused of giving a, an inaccurate reference uh, for a former employee. Um, she, they did a, Coventry University did the right thing. They did a preliminary investigation, decided, yeah, there was a case to answer here. So they um, commenced disciplinary proceedings against this lady. She went off sick with stress. 
the disciplinary continued quite properly. They did it in a, in a quite proper way. Um, and I decided that actually she hadn't done anything wrong and the um, disciplinary wasn't upheld. She brought a claim and said, you should never have progressed the disciplinary. Um, clearly, the outcome was that I was exonerated. So, you know, you've, you've subjected me to stress and I should be able to recover a claim. Um, and what the court said was no. They did an investigation. They realised there was a case to answer. The test is whether it was within the reasonable range of decisions that an employer could make. You can't expect all employers to be perfect. They're not always going to make absolutely the right decisions. But as long as it was a reasonable decision based on the evidence that they had at the time, then they were quite entitled in this case to proceed with that disciplinary and it's not a breach of duty. So a properly carried out disciplinary is perfectly acceptable. Um, contrast that with the case of YAP. Um, and the Foreign Office, uh, Foreign and Commonwealth Office. And that was where there was an over chap over working overseas. Um, he was accused of sexual misconduct. The Foreign Office went, oh, potential yeah. reputational issues. And they dragged him back without doing any kind of investigation whatsoever. Turned out that actually the, it was entirely spurious. The, the allegations against him were just absolute nonsense. Um, and the court said, yeah, you were basically in breach of duty to him because you didn't do anything the investigation at all and you knee-jerk reaction dragged him out of his post so that was a breach of duty that breach of duty did cause him an injury so you know you caused him an injury there's no there's no question there but they still fell down on the foreseeability hurdle because they said it wasn't foreseeable that somebody in that situation being removed from their post would suffer a psychiatric injury they'd be stressed by it they'd be upset by it they'd probably be livid but th th it's not foreseeable that they would suffer a psychiatric injury as a result so that foreseeable foreseeability mm. hurdle is still there um you, Chris talked about breach of contract, that you still need mm. to have foreseeability and breach of contract claims to get psychiatric injury awards. Um, one of the main banes of my life is breach of policies. That insureds are dreadful. Uh, they produce these fantastic, all singing, all dancing, amazing, mm. aren't we wonderful employers? We're doing everything for our employees, policies that they never comply with because mm. they're so difficult. You know, it's, we'll respond to you in two days of you sending us a grievance. No, you won't. Don't put it in the policy. Mm. Mm. So, they, so that's one of the main problems. That, that's not going to give rise to a claim generally unless that policy is an incorporation to the contract of employment but the what it does do is that it just upsets the employees and they think they've got a claim because there's been a breach of policy or well, they breached their policy they said they were going to do that they didn't so they're disgruntled already and then it makes them more inclined to bring claims so the breach policy tends to be a, tends to just encourage claims as much as anything else um another kind of important point that i just wanted to touch on was um it, uh, essentially causation um, all you have to prove in a psychiatric injury claim f in negligence is material contribution to the injury which is a pretty low threshold all you've got to show is that the contribution that your breach made was more than negligible so it's a really low threshold on causation in, in stress claims um, it's important to remember it has to be the breach because of course the claimant will chuck a million allegations at you and if only two of them stick those two have to have made that material contribution. So often when you get medical expert evidence in, it'll say, well, yes, the work has made a material contribution to their injury. Yes, but what aspect of the work? You know, was it the disciplinary which we followed in a perfectly appropriate manner? Or was it actually the, because he was told to F off by one of his colleagues once? You know, what's, what's the cause of that material contribution? So, um, but it is still a low threshold and you have to be quite careful with that. Um, it is important to remember though that um, Although material contribution is for the injury, what you can argue is a but-for test in relation to special damages. Mm. That um, although you've caused the injury, so you're liable for the, for the general damages of that injury, if because their dog died two weeks ago, they would have gone off sick in any event, then you can argue that they don't get over the but-for test and therefore you're not liable for the lost earnings that flow from that. You're only liable mm. for, the, um, for the injury element, and that can knock out a huge amount of the claim, huge amount of the claim, because often the, the biggest value of the claim is, is the lost earnings element. So that's worth bearing in mind. Um, the other thing is in relation to apportionment. Um, there's a long-running discussion about whether you can apportion damages in um, psychiatric injury claims. A Baroness Hale in, in Hatton and Sutherland said you can. A Lady Justice Smith in Dickens and O2 said you can't. Both decisions are over to there's no guiding judgment on it. But actually, my general understanding from most psychiatrists is that they don't think you probably can really. Any, any eminent psychiatrist will probably say, stress, comes, stress is so multifactorial that there's so many influences and they all interplay with each other. It's not as though um, they each stand alone in terms of contributing towards a psychiatric injury. You know, they, they do all have an impact on each other. And as a result of that, um, it's unlikely that you're going to get an expert to say it's divisible. 
so apportionment unlikely. Um, there's just a few also um, additional things I want to talk about on the Protection from Harassment Act. Um, as Chris mentioned, you don't have to prove foreseeability under the PHA. So the hurdle, the, 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 what stops us having um, a floodgate of claims is the test of harassment, what constitutes harassment. And it's a reasonably high hurdle. You know, it's got to be oppressive and unacceptable conduct. It's got to be of an order that would attract criminal liability. It's really quite a high hurdle that, that claimants have to get over. So claimants are desperately trying to erode that. They're trying to reduce the, the, the criteria for, um, uh, for what's required under harassment. The number of times I see it pleaded where everyone knows the test is, well, anyone, you know, the lawyers should know the test is ex oppressive and unacceptable conduct. And the number of times I see it quoted as oppressive and unreasonable, which is a much lower threshold than that. Um, but so, so just want to touch on a couple of cases um, that have come out relatively recently. Um, Ferguson and British Gas. This is a, one of probably one of the first um, cases of harassment by computer, which um, which is a that t proper technophobe as, uh, as I am is just is brilliant news because it's just basically evidence that computers are taking over the world and they're evil. Um, Mrs. Ferguson didn't pay her gas bill. The fact that she wasn't actually a British Gas customer <laughs> and uh, didn't owe British Gas any money whatsoever didn't seem to deter British Gas. Um, she told them that she wasn't a British Gas customer and she didn't owe them any money, but the plucky British Gas co computer <laughs> kept going and churned out letter after letter, becoming increasingly threatening, telling her that they were going to issue court proceedings against her, that she was going to have county court judgments against her, she needed to you know, pay this money that she didn't owe. And, of course, the judge said, harassment under the Protection from Harassment Act. Um, it doesn't matter if it's a computer-generated um, document. You're in control of that computer. You need to sort out your systems. It's not, you know, we're not having you getting a defense on the basis that this is just a computer-generated thing. There's no one person harassing her. It, your organization's harassing her, so you need to stop. So that was one of the first cases where it's, you know, extending who can, who can be responsible under the Act. Um, Roberts and RBS was very similar. Um, RBS made over 500 phone calls to this lady over the course of less than a year um, to talk about her account with her. And she told them on several times, I don't want to talk about my account with you, please go away. And they wouldn't, they just kept phoning, kept phoning, kept phoning. And again, the court said it's harassment. Compare that to Calland um, and the Financial Conduct Authority, where it was only three times that contact was made um, a letter, a phone call, and an email. Now, similar sort of tone in Roberts and in um, potentially in early stages of Ferguson. Um, but because it was only three times that it was done, there's no liability under the Protection from Harassment Act. And it's because of the context. You know, it's, it's not about necessarily the individual acts themselves. It's the fact that in, in Ferguson and Roberts, there's this cumulative effect of 500 phone calls and, and relentless, relentless letters um, to Ferguson. Um, and so context is really important. It's not necessarily the individual acts, but, it, but context is important. Um, does it have to be criminal? Well, as I mentioned before, um, it has to reach the level of an order that would attract criminal liability. Um, one of the defences that has been run on these is that, well, um, no, no prosecution would ever run this. You know, cases where it's a, it's a manager harassing a, a member of staff, well, this, the Crown Prosecution Service isn't going to pursue that. No prosecutor is going to pursue that. Um, but in um, Vikings and Kearislington, the judge said, that's not the right test. The test is, is it of an order that would attract criminal liability? So is the, is the seriousness of the offence of an order that would attract criminal liability? It doesn't matter whether the CPS would ever have pursued it as a, as a prosecution. That's not the point. It's whether, it's whether the level of the offence is enough to be criminal liability. And that, that, um, that threshold still stands. So it still has to be serious enough for it to be a criminal offence. Um, the last one on, under the PHA is, does it have to be targeted at the claimant? Now, historically, it's always the case that if you were going to bring a claim under the Act, it had to be targeted at the claimant. The behaviour had to be targeted at the claimant. Um, and then came along the case of Levi and Levi and Bates. Um, Mr Bates uh, controlled Leeds Football Club and he had various grievances against Mr Levi and so he thought he'd be very clever. What he did in, in two of his newsletters um, for the football club, he said, if you don't like the way things are going, Here's Mr. Levi's name, uh, name, address, and phone number. You might want to address some of your issues to Mr. Levi, knowing that, of course, there'd be this flurry of um, correspondence and phone calls towards Mr. Levi and his, uh, his, at his personal home. Um, so Mr. Levi brought a claim, but Mrs. Levi also brought a claim, because what she said was, 
you knew when you put that in there that I lived in that house and you know that I'm going to be subject to that harassment as much as my husband's going to be. And for the first time, the court said, you're right. You can, you can be awarded damages because it's foreseeable that you would fall within the harassment. You would be subjected to the same um, degree of behaviour and um, you'd have the same uh, anxiety and distress as a result of it. So first time you had cases where it doesn't have to be actually be targeted at the claimant. People who are sort of on the periphery can also be drawn in. Um, another area that's um, expanding at the moment is um, vicarious liability. Um, and uh, it touches in relation to stress claims because under the Protection from Harassment Act, you have to prove vicarious liability for an employer to be responsible. Um, it also, in discrimination cases, it also applies sometimes to prove that you're, you're responsible for the acts of your employees. Um, and also, you occasionally get assault cases and things um, in stress at work, you get sexual assault cases, that kind of thing. So vicarious liability can be an important part of um, a, a stress at work claim. Uh, the, the quote at the top was what one of my um, a, a, a managing director of one of the um, insured companies that I was acting for said to me um, when I suggested that actually he was going to be vicariously liable for what one of his employees had done. He just had no, he just didn't get it at all that that he mm -hmm. could possibly be responsible for something somebody one of his idiot employees had done. Um, there's a sort of two-stage test with vicarious liability. Is the relationship between the wrongdoer and the defendant sufficient that the defendant should have to be responsible for this person's behaviour? Normally it's employees. Um, the Catholic Church cases have extended it to um, uh, things that are akin to employment. Paula's at the back, she'll be able to tell you more about this. Um, <laughs> so anything that's akin to employment, employment can also fall into that category. And it's been extended even further in the case of Cox and Ministry of Justice. Um, and this is a case involving the prison service where... Um, a prison prisoner um, who was working in the prison kitchens accidentally dropped a massive sack of grain onto one of the prison officers' backs and injured him quite badly. I'm sure he was very sorry about it. Um, and uh, there was an argument as to whether vicarious liability applied, and the court said yes, because although he's not an employee, he's, he, you know, there's no employment relationship there whatsoever. He's sort of doing work for you, and he's sort of under your control, so therefore we're going to vicarious liability so it's stretching vicarious liability um, the second test is if you establish that relationship is there a sufficiently close connection between the relationship and the unlawful act that's being done so is there um, a close connection between what, what you're employed to do and what you did um, and again this is being stretched um, and the case of uh, Mahmood and Morrison's I don't know if you've a lot of you have heard about this, it's quite well publicised. It went to the Supreme Court. Um, and this was a customer in Morrison's um, garage, I think. Um, and he went to the garage and had the audacity to ask for some assistance. And as he left, the guy behind the counter came out and quite violently assaulted him for some inexplicable reason. Um, defended initially on the basis that this was so beyond what he was employed to do that it's vicarious liability shouldn't apply. Um, but the Supreme Court said no, he was employed to serve customers, he was employed to deal with customers' issues, and he was part of that role he was undertaking when he committed the assault, and therefore vicarious liability applied. So vicarious liability is, is stretching, which means that um, in terms of protection from harassment at cases, you're going to see more vicarious liability <coughs> applying in those kind of cases because things like assaults and stuff are becoming more commonplace. Now, briefly, we're, we're, we're on the home street. Um, because um, we're, we're looking at um, where the emerging issues uh, might come from um, uh, as we move forward. And um, I mentioned that uh, uh, discrimination can arise in PL context uh, rather than just in the EL context as well. So service providers can find themselves in the thick end of discrimination claims. And I've referred to access tourists there. I've dealt with a few cases in the past where uh, retailers have faced problems with um, people who genuinely do have disabilities um, actively seeking out premises which have uh, which are not compliant with the Equality Act in terms of access, uh, going round a number of those premises perhaps on the same day or the same weekend, suffering an equal degree of upset about their inability to access the premises and then uh, banging in claims. So um, that these these kind of claims uh, can arise, probably will continue to arise. 
Um, I've mentioned tag-ons, for example, to breach of contract cases, and I mentioned a case there called Gooney, which uh, it was a professional indemnity case against solicitors in relation to their handling of uh, a claim in relation to the estate of a deceased person, and it also involved a dispute between uh, a family who were involved in running their own business. Not the kind of claim that you would think would have any kind of distress claim involved in it whatsoever, but they tagged on a claim for um, distress and upset to it. Um, the court was able to deal with it and said, look, um, the, the judge said the central issue of whether there has been negligence on the part of the defendant is not a platform for remote and unforeseen claims. So the judge was alive to this, that this was an attempt to tag on um, what could have been a personal injury claim, uh, certainly a distress claim, which might have been caught by some of the wider wordings that Vanessa started off the session by talking about, uh, and the judge fortunately was, uh, was robust enough to knock it out, but watch for tag-ons. Uh, distress, upset, and potentially psychiatric injury claims being tagged on to matters which genuinely have nothing to do uh, with a normal personal injury claim. Um, um, Vanessa's mentioned uh, Ferguson and Roberts. I won't dwell on that as we're short of time, but I did mention the Data Protection Act uh, earlier on, and there is a case, Vidal Hall and others, against Google, uh, which was about uh, the whole situation you may remember in the news where Safari was, uh, was uh, capturing uh, browser-generated information to allow targeted advertising um, without people um, choosing the opt-in in relation to that. So it was a, a breach of the Data Protection Act, uh, and the question was whether the action which arises under the Data Protection Act for damage uh, covers distress. Now, actually, the Act doesn't damage, doesn't cover distress, but the way that the Court of Appeal approached it, it is, is to say that that's incompatible with the European Charter on Fundamental Rights of the European Union, and they had to interpret Article 47 of the Charter to make the Data Protection Act give a right for distress because otherwise there would have been incompatibility. Now the question is, will that decision survive Brexit? I don't know, is the, is the question, we are due to have the new General Data Protection Regulation coming in 2018, just before we leave the European Union, which technically will apply automatically in the UK. What the UK government will do about data protection thereafter, who knows? Um, and the other point to mention, I think, uh, briefly, is that you will, if you're handling one of these hybrid types of claims, you may be running alongside uh, DNO insurers, professional indemnity insurers, and others until you can work out what triggers your policy, what triggers their policy, particularly in situations where you're dealing with subclinical injury to feelings, for example. Um, and briefly, that, that's me done. You've just got a couple of more minutes with Vanessa. Yes, yeah, so other emerging issues um, whistleblowing. Public interest disclosures where um, somebody says there's been a legal breach, a criminal breach, or a um, health and safety breach, and they blow the whistle and they suffer a detriment as a result. You can get injury to feelings uh, as part of that claim, but it's an underutilised area, and it's one that where, as we mentioned, these um, policy wordings are expanding into things like mental anguish that potentially insurers are going to be dragged into. Uh, the other one is social media. Um, you know. I'm constantly amazed about what people put on social media. I can't quite believe what people put on Facebook. Um, I think probably particularly my generation where I just think it's all magic anyway and I don't know how it works. Um, that uh, you can't quite, but people just don't really understand that, you know, if they put something publicly, they haven't got their security settings right, that actually they're, they're telling everyone that their boss is a bit of a wazzock to three million people, you know, potentially. Um, so use of that, if you have claims, perfectly entitled if you've got it because they've publicly um, disclosed it to people, then you're perfectly entitled to use it. Of course, on the flip side, if your employees are bullying each other over social media and there's an expansion of vicarious liability, you've got the potential for that to be, you'd be drawn into that um, uh, if your employees are behaving badly, particularly if they're using things like your Twitter feed, your work Twitter feeds, because often people will tw tweet from work. So there's, there's that sort of area is, is definitely a growth area. Um, Impact of 24 hour accessibility was, was, is about you know, the fact that we've all got Blackberries, we've all got laptops, we've all got, you know, leaving the office doesn't mean leaving work, and that people are much more, um, there's less distinction between your work and your home life. There's much more of a blurring of those lines. Um, so far as stress at work claims are, are concerned, I think it's unlikely to have a massive impact other than uh, the point where people start saying, I'm not coping very well with this because I'm constantly being phoned all the time, I'm constantly being I'm contacted, um, it's, it's affecting my health. So unless you, you're putting your employer on notice that that's causing a problem, I think you're unlikely to face claims. But once they do tell you that, then 
you know you have to take action to, to address that um, but I think that's going to be an increasing area uh, and finally the last thing was uh, was brexit um, a stress claim is going to be affected by brexit <sighs> probably not um, as Chris mentioned, there's a potential for legislative change. You know, a lot of our employment laws, a lot of discrimination law comes directly from Europe. A lot of our health and safety laws come directly from Europe. But I don't think there's a massive appetite for changing drastically as soon as Brexit happens. Um, are we going to face compensation claims for staff who feel bullied over expressing their Brexit views, as the Telegraph thinks? No, I don't think so. And that's it. Sorry for going on so long. <laughs>